Hello and welcome, all you nice people. Uh, my name is Lone Nyhus. I'm the general manager of the Danish Film and Media Composer and the coordinator of Nordic Film Composers Network and the Harper Nordic Film Composers Award. Uh, welcome to this seminar, uh, seminar number five in our edition, uh, online seminar edition. And, and um, I'm very happy to say that with us, we have three very close friends of the Nordic Film Composers Network, Tor Joachim Hager, who has also been a keynote speaker and a panelist, and Markus Paus, uh, last year's Norwegian nominee for Harper Nordic Film Composers Award, and Christina Hals, who has been visiting the event three times, once as a um, as a performing artist and another time as a panelist. And now again, as a panelist. Well, welcome. And Tor Joachim, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Lone. Uh, yes, my name is Tor Joachim Haga. I'm an editor of a film music site called CelluloidTunes.no. And um, the topic for this uh, seminar or webinar, as, you, as we usually call it, is something that we've called trend sounds in contemporary film music. I, I know that sounds a bit vague at the moment, but we'll try to, to specify uh, eventually. And I, I would like to say that uh, to all of you uh, watching, please send in your, your um, remarks or questions and we will get to them by the end of the, uh, the conversation. Um, so uh, we have um, invited two uh, Norwegian composers, as Lone said, Marcus Paus and uh, Christina Hals. And what I think is interesting is that we have all these different fields of experience here that might get us closer to, to this topic. Uh, Marcus, of course, you have experience both from the film music industry as well as writing a lot of uh, concert music. So you have those two arenas, and, and you, Christina, you have experience both from the U.S. film industry and the Norwegian uh, film industry. You recently scored your first uh, major motion picture here in Norway called The Kampen om Norvik, The Battle of Norvik, which I think was supposed to have a premiere right now, but it's been postponed. Yes, for yeah. the third time, actually. For the third Unfortunately. time. Unfortunately. Yeah, oh. due to various circumstances. Yes. Um, and then myself have more of a journalistic or research background. So somewhere in in these fields of, of exper experience, we should try to approach this subject matter. Uh, before we go into the specifics of these trend sounds, I wanted to ask you uh, about your, your own personal experience. Um, whether there has been um, moments in your work with film where you had to adhere to a certain type of idiom or style, whether it has been used as a temp track or that the director has told you to, or uh, whether you yourself has tapped into those kinds of trend sounds in a way. Have you had any experience with that at all, uh, Marcus? Well, I think it's difficult to avoid that because when you're working with directors and producers, um, their language and their lingo and basically the... the um, the premise for the musical conversation would be other films. Um, so I think it's unavoidable. Um, now, I'm not really a, well, I, I, like all other composers, I'm not, not a huge fan of temp tracks, um, but they can be sort of interesting as a starting point because that's, that's, that's really where the conversation about the music starts. And, and certainly with my experience in film, um, limited as it may be, um, that's always been part of it. And, and um, now I'm not really, well, there are certain things I, I guess I could ape, but I'm not really a good, I'm not, not, not really a fan of, of, of doing that. So I think what's interesting to me when that arises is really if I can find a way within my own language to do something that might suggest similar musical terrain or might achieve the same effect or a similar effect or possibly a better effect. Uh, just to follow up, for example, your, your recent film score for Mortal, yeah. for Andre Övredal. Um, this was a fairly big big project. Was there any point during the production where you sort of, oh, I have to uh, tap into this sort of... Well, I mean, the first assembly of the film was tempted, I think, mostly with Interstellar, um, which is a very specific soundscape, um, and it's not really easily reproducible, and it's very far removed from my language. Um, but what it did suggest to me was a certain tenor of voice, a certain kind of, of sonority, a certain 
um, speed, um, a certain... Um, well, I mean, uh, there's a slowness to that music, even though it's, it's constantly moving. There's a stillness to it, or a static aspect to it. Um, so that was that was, I think, part of our early conversations. I mean, was there a way for me to do something that would be similar in effect but different? And so, yeah, I mean, and I've 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 had the experience in other projects where I've been not specifically asked to do something completely identical or as identical as I can, but but you you can kind of tell that that's really what they want. It's like, we want this piece that we have here, but but we can't use it. Um, so so that's always, a, a, I think, problematic, and it's um, par for the course. Great. Christina, how about you? Um, I have to say that I really like having temp tracks because it helps me to understand that, first of all, this is where the music's supposed to come in and go out, so the director has some sort of meaning. Um, and also sometimes the temp track tells me that, wow, this music is so wrong <laughs> and so I'm going to find something better. Or sometimes or very often I can find the essence of the music is there, even if the music might not be right. But I, I try to talk to the director to figure out why do you like this? What is it that you like? Because sometimes it might just be the drone in the background or it could be that it's very dynamic. Uh, it could be a specific instrument, and when you have a temp track, it's just telling you something, and you you can figure out what to pick out and what to just um, forget about. Um, and so, so for me, I think that temp tracks more of a help uh, navigate because a film could be like one two hours long, and it's it's so much for you to think of already. So for me, I think it's a really big help. What about um, your specific work now on uh, Kampen om Narvik, the Battle of Narvik? Were there any moments there where you either in the process you, you could hear yourself making a type of sound that is common, I guess, throughout the... Because the, the genre here is a, is a war film. Uh, so um, what, what was that like? Was there any sort of uh, moment where you felt that like you're now emulating a very trendy sound in that production? I don't know. Um, I just, I just feel the scene. I feel the music, and I'm, I make what I feel, and then the director will say yes or no, or maybe. Uh, but the film was obviously, I would say, uh, or expectedly, uh, attempt with 1917 uh, by Thomas Newman, and also Dunkirk by Hans Zimmer, and I tried to of course find my own version of it uh, but there's one scene um, where um, Dunkirk like I I, can't, I copied the tempo but I don't think it sounds like I have I'm also using similar instruments and the rhythms are kind of similar and to, to, de- to get that exact same tempo feeling but I still think that most people wouldn't think oh that's Dunkirk mm. And uh, I was uh, I went to the screening, one of the pre, uh, pre-screenings with uh, the crew, and I think it was one of the distributors. He heard that oh that organ is that uh, were you inspired by 1917? And I thought well probably, but not intentionally. It's so it goes into your mind, and sometimes people can hear it. Um, but I always try to find my own mm. way in. So. Yeah, and, and, and I realized it's quite difficult to speak about this without getting specific. So we should try to get a bit more specific now, but what types of trend sounds are we talking about? And and uh, last year I, I, I listened to many new soundtracks, about 1,500 new soundtracks from 2021. And when you listen to that much, you can, you can glean certain trends, obviously. And one of the trends um, that I've noticed, not just last year, but over the last 15, is something, and especially also in the Nordic countries, is something that I have abbreviated as TTD, the tentative texture drone, which is particularly prevalent in certain types of of, um, realistic drama films, if you could call it that. Um, Can I ask, what's your, if if you know what I'm talking about, what's your relation to that kind of popular uh, drone sound at the moment, uh, Marcus? Well, I mean, I, I understand why why it's become very popular. I mean, it's and certainly within the, the type of genre that you're describing, um, it kind of solves a, an ancient problem of, of 
you know the need for music, but but also the mu- the need for the music to be invisible. Um, so it's it's very practical, um, and I suppose it's convenient, and I suppose it's relatively easy to produce from a technical point of view. Um, also, it's not a script. It's something that's rarely intrusive, um, and I think it kind of. If, and it's interesting why, and I, I'm trying to figure out why, but I, it certainly seems to work well with the idea of filmic reality. Um, not really sure why. Maybe it's because we think reality is boring. Um, but, I mean, it, there's something about it that it, it, it doesn't really suggest drama. It just It's background. It's nondescript. It can, it can work with pretty much anything. And I think, most importantly, it binds together. Um, and I think maybe that, from an edit- editing point of view, I think that's why we need it. Because, um, and I might talk about this a little bit later, but I think there's a tendency in film editing and digital editing for uh, images to move faster. So, whereas once upon a time, music existed to add life. Now we're, I don't want to say we're adding death, but we're, uh, or subtracting life. But, what we're, what, but music exists to bind things together. Uh, and I think that's more important now, perhaps, than in earlier decades. Yeah, like, like tissue material almost. Yeah. 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 Uh, Christine, um, what's your take on this uh, trend, as I'd like to call it? Well, we actually talked about a little earlier today how the drones is actually very archaic, as you said. I think is a good word, descriptive word. Uh, it's it's a drone is very meditative and it's very uh, like trance that's how they use it actually uh, so it's kind of pulling you in and it's telling you something like it creates suspension something's coming and so i think that we've actually had it for a long time in music and the only thing that might have changed slightly is well the synthesizers came in in the 50s 60s and you were able to get more and more specific in how you create sounds and so how i've for instance, for Narvik, I wrote actually lots of melodies and kind of the classical kind of uh, with the light motifs and everything. But I also made my own sounds that, for instance, I, I wanted to create something that like because the film has trains, like the train, like that's one of the reasons why Hitler wanted Narvik because of the Malm and the, the iron that came from Sweden would train. And so they tried to stop the train from coming. So I thought, okay, I want to make something with a train whistle. So I I sampled a train whistle from the 40s, and then I took my own voice and and I was whistled and I I like scream and I make this uh, train whistle, which is uh, organic in its own way, but I also made it human by adding my own voice, and so that is in the in the film and it's not as a train whistle, but it has that in it and i've also uh, sampled other like things like fans and and choirs and i've stretched it and so just to to make some sort of um like a drone or something in the background to just create some sort of an atmosphere and like you're saying also just to make like glue it all together mm-hmm. I think this is very interesting when you talk about atmosphere. Uh, I should point out that there is nothing inherently wrong with a drone. Uh, there are good drones and bad drones, uh, but it, it's an interesting trend. And uh, you, Marcus, you, you, you said, why? And um, when you said that, uh, many things occurred to me. But, um, for example, the proposition that uh, uh, is there a fear of melody as a rhetorical tool today in in film music um, just throwing it out there you know like in to kill a mockingbird for example by elmer bernstein you have these beautiful uh, dialogue scenes uh, today one would expect maybe some sort of drone underneath to, to let the dialogue speak for itself but what bernstein did was to pinpoint certain timbres of the dialogue and what was being said so there was a lot of musicality inside that uh, obviously, far more rhetorical than you see today. So, this fear of melody is that just something that I concocted, or is there some truth to it? Well, I think there's truth to it, um, but I also think that um, there's been truth that before. I think these trends change in t- over time, and I think it's probably it'll probably change again. And I think you know, melody is great for certain things, and there are certain things that that I mean, you, me- melody is irreplaceable. Uh, truly, I mean, there's there's nothing to, to you, you can't really substitute it with 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 a drone or with a texture. Uh, but it's also you know it, it takes up a lot of space. 
Uh, and I think that's part of the fear of it. Um, and I think, I mean, I've, I've, I've had that experience on, on numerous occasions, um, either that there's, um, well, usually if, if, if the feedback is there's too much melody, it might also be that the melody is too active. Um, and that's another tendency. I mean, melodies, there, there are, I mean, there are melodies in most film scores, um, but there has been a, a general tendency for those melodies to evolve more slowly. Um, there has also, I think, been a tendency for the harmonic and, and melodic language to be more uh, simplified or unified, and, and in many ways, um, perhaps closer in design to popular music um, and to a, sp a specific kind of slow stillness of pop music. There is, I mean, there, I think that that's there is a. Um, there's an element of melancholy that I think is 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 now usually uh, translated musically into pure minor, uh, whereas you know the, the the films and soundscapes that I grew up with, and I think most of us grew up with, you the, you know they would have music that was much more um, well in, in many ways much more harmonically sophisticated, and w where you'd use harmony as a a way of of engaging with the action and uh, engaging with the drama, and and I don't really see that so often anymore. I mean, some composers still do it, uh, but I think that there's a um, there's a certain homogeneity in in a lot of the harmonic language these days. Um, and I think again, it has to do with the, the same pair of melody. And it's not it's it's really about where you can put music uh, without it intruding on the film. Christina. <clears throat> Yeah, it's also very much about genre because if you score an animated feature, there's lots of room for the so so that's you you want to avoid that in an, in a drama. You don't want someone to like almost Mickey Mouse the action. You want it to just feel natural. And and as a film composer, we know that it's about scoring the film and the drama. It's not the music. It's not supposed to be in the center. So the less less is more kind of. So you you want to write a good theme but it shouldn't take too much attention um, so f uh, like I said I use lots of light motifs in uh, the Narvik movie um, but very often just to uh, to uh, remind okay so that's the love theme you, I only took a few notes because you recognize that after a while and so I think that that's maybe a secret that people and they even did that in the operas as well that you have just a little bit of the melody not the whole melody yeah. to remind and I actually reminded of um, when you said that, I'm reminded of something that I think Bernard Herrmann said because he considered melody the most rational element in music so to gain access to the irrational which was his forte in a way in the Hitchcock movies and so on he, he divided the melody he used sort of small tone clusters instead repetitive tone clusters and that way uh, the audience didn't get that kind of resolution that they usually expect. So there's there's effective uses of that as oh, well. Oh, absolutely. And again, I'm, there's nothing inherently wrong with with the simplifying of, of melody. And I think that, um, well, I mean, Herman's a great example. He, his approach is, is, I guess you would call it motivic. Uh, it's cellular. Um, and of course, he was an expert craftsman in, in devising those. So there is something about his three note cells um, that really work, you know, and, and the way he worked, he, he'll, he would work them out over the course of a film, and there's a certain um, insistence on them, and even sort of an obsession in, in how we would use it that's, I think, is, is remarkable and remarkably effective. Um, now, I will say there is a... Um, there is also a place, or there used to be a place for more expansive melodies in film. And, you know, I think that, um, again, so many of the films that I remember growing up with, if you'd taken out those scores and replaced them with contemporary scores, they wouldn't soar the way they used to soar. And, 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 um, and maybe they're, that's suggestive of a certain naivete. I mean, we can look at something like Superman, for instance, now, which is, I think, a beautifully innocent film. I mean, I'm speaking about the, the 1978 Richard Donner film. Um, there's something, and I recently rewatched it um, in preparing for this, because it's, it's kind of the opposite of where we're at now. Um, and there's something about that flying sequence which is just completely, I mean, it would not have been made, I mean, you would not see that in a Marvel picture. Uh, it would have been, I think, construed as, as probably ironic. Um, but there's something so innocent about it. And it, it, the, way, the way the music soars and the, the room that's left for it to soar, I think is really, really beautiful. And there's something very profound about how it, it just the way it understands what music can contribute to film. And I think that's really... That should be our concern, not 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 just as composers, but as filmmakers. You know, 
the, the question is, what can music contribute? Um, and I think it's an unanswerable question. I mean, it, it, and there, it, hopefully, I don't, I don't think we'll ever, ever get to the end of it. But it's something that, um, um, it's also, I guess, part of the, the problem with trends is they tend to kind of think they have an answer for it. So it, it, it will shut things off and, and, and we'll be sort of stuck in a present until, you know, someone finds a key to unlock the present and show us something else. Mm. Yeah, I'm <clears throat> talking about superhero movies, like Marvel and DC movies, they, I, I think that they just sound similar, very similar, and there's so much room to actually just do something new there. It's, like it's sci-fi kind of like it's, you're in this alternate uh, universe, so that's, that's one place where I think that music might have gotten stuck in some sort of a trend where there's so much more space and room. Uh, speaking of that, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but haven't you worked on, on something superhero related? Uh, the, uh, yes. Aero and, Origins? Or? Oh, yeah. I, I sang in, Ant- in Ant-Man and the Wasp. But yes, I have wrote music for uh, a web series called Arrow, and uh, that was fun. And yeah, I, I, I was able to use the big brushes and, and write quite a, quite a big score and it was animated. So, but, but the music really got a lot of space and the director really loves music. So that was, that was a fun job. Um, so yeah, that, that's superhero music where the, um, but I think that how I approached that, I don't think I use any drones, honestly. I just wrote orchestral music with melodies and um, choir. Oh, so that's a bit unusual then in in the current climate. Well, maybe I think that they use choirs. If that was, uh, they use choirs a lot. Uh, but and I think also that they they actually with the Marvel movies, DC movies, they're just wall to wall music, which I think is a, almost a little boring because you stop listening because it's just so much. You want dynamic. I yeah. think that's so important. Yeah, that's actually another point that I will get back to the the, the axis of loudness and and the amount of music. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, I wanted to touch on another sort of related trend sound, if you could call it that, and that is the sort of uh, the ostinato-driven, the rhythmical patterns of contemporary action films. And uh, when I teach film music history, I usually uh, put the the big landslide around uh, the first Jason Bourne film that uh, that John Powell composed, the, the so-called uh, Bourne riff, which I think is like a, a 16th note ostinato, and then there are slight harmonic variations, which became the benchmark for uh, up until this day. And I, in my opinion, th- there are very few action films that don't adhere to that in some way mm. uh, or another. Um, wh- have you any experience with that kind of style? I know that you... Well, in, in terms of writing? Yeah. Well, I mean, Mortal didn't really have a lot of that in it. There were there were a couple of ostinatos, but I think that just in general, ostinatos, they, they, they're sort of the rhythmic equivalent of a drone. Um, they tie together. Yes. Um, and, and it's great for editing. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just a really useful tool. Um, and it's also, I mean, it, from a writing perspective, it's, it's great for writing. It, it, you know, and, and speaking of, of Herman, I mean, it's, you know, have, having all of those repeat marks, you know, it's, it's just like if you, if you need to write an action sequence and, and, and you're, you're in a crunch, then, then ostinato is, is, is the way to go. Um, and you can be creative with it. And I mean, certainly there's a lot of contemporary or, well, not even that contemporary. I mean, let's say a lot of, lot of concert music of the last 40 years uh, has been ostinato driven, um, the, the not so avant garde aspects of it and and um you know it's 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 great i mean we i think we respond to that the way we respond to drones and that there's something archaic about it there's there's something about the propulsion that that just that that grabs you and and, and like you said it, it, it adds a su- suspense or suspension i mean you, you, and, and it, it tells you that something is going to happen or that something is happening. But but the re- you have to agree that there, there's a, a very interesting difference between, let's say, a 90s film like Independence Day or Cutthroat Island or something, as opposed to the similar type of film. Uh, oh, absolutely. And I think uh, part of it is technology. I mean, so much of... of, of I would I, I would guess that most film music written today is at least in part electronic. And it used to be, you know, orchestra with electronics, and now it's probably electronics with orchestra. Um, so th- there's been a shift there as well. 
Um, but I think you know the, the scores you're addressing. The, they're mostly orchestral scores, and, and an orchestral ostinato is usually a little bit different than than an, an, an ostinato that's electronically driven. I mean, the function is the same, um, but usually you'll you'll have a rhythmic pattern, um, and that that might be electronic, um, and you'll add orchestral elements to it. Whereas if you want to do an orchestral ostinato. Um, it requires a little bit more work. It's it's a little bit more. Um, well, I mean, it, it just entails a little bit more ink. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You you have to know how to actually if if it's going to be playable for because sometimes if you sit with your computer you can make an impossible ostinato work, but it's not possible to play it for the orchestra. Um, and I also think a challenge with ostinatos is to come up with something new because it's a regular stuff that always works and it's so. I, I actually did write some ostinatos for Narvik. I I experimented a lot with uh, five four and seven eight and seven four just because I think it's fun. Um, but I think that it just and I, I loved what I did, but it was it didn't work for the director, and it, so it wasn't used in the film. But I think that if you want to be creative with ostinatos, you might have to be like you have to put in some work because it's so easy to fall into the typical trap and then it sounds just like everything else really yeah well I mean a, a great example of ostinato writing I think a, a little bit more recent um, still not that recent but Jerry Goldsmith used to be sort of the king of, of odd time ostinatos and 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 um, and his rhythmic patterns because they there's always an irregularity to it um, it kind of keeps your, you interested um, and I guess that's um there might be an element of conceit to that, that you know, that, that a composer should even think that the audience is listening. But um, but we do listen. Uh, I certainly did, and I'm sure we all did. And there's something about that where you know you're you're you're. It's not like you're not even counting. You're you're, you're just feeling it. There is there is a, a viscerality to it that I think just um, it works for certain type of, of types of films really really well. That's true, and there is also, I think, a sort of evolution going uh, towards ostinato-driven scores. You know, um, you have the classic minimalists, for example, like Philip Glass and Terry Riley and Steve Reich and all this. And then you have a trend nowadays that I like to call sort of post-minimalist romanticism. Composers like uh, Abel Korsniowski, Dario Marianelli, uh, Max Richter, who have used that sort of minimalism and then added more, I guess, more melody, more more things happening. Certainly, and, and what's interesting, again, with, with something like, like Max Richter is, is how... Baroque harmony has become a thing again. I mean, and, and which, which is really kind of quaint. I mean, it, it used to be, Baroque harmony used to be a thing in the '80s. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I was a back when I was a kid. I, I used to play a little bit of guitar, and I remember, you know, there was this whole shred scene with Ingvar Malmsteen and, and all of these '80s hair metal bands and so on. And they would use Baroque harmony, and and Max Richter has actually brought it back, which I think is is fascinating. It's it, it sounds really quaint to me, but it, it's it's. It's sort of wonderful, and it, it has an expressivity to it that I think we connect to very quickly. Yeah, I love the, his uh, re, remake of uh, the Four Seasons. Yeah. It's so Vivaldi cool. recomposed, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah he, he's just a, a classic example of a trend, and it's what was very interesting when I saw the television series Tales from the Loop, which had music by Philip Glass and Paul uh, Leonard Morgan. And here you have now the pioneer Philip Glass uh, approximating composers who are themselves approximating him. So you have this speaking of evolution of, of Austin Alter driven thing. It was just very uh, yeah, fascinating. I think that that's 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 actually a really, really fun observation. Um that, that he's approximating composers approximating him. It's, it's sort of like the death of culture in a sense. <laughs> Pop eats itself, isn't that the term? Yeah. Um uh, we talked a little bit about loudness and amount, and although that isn't sort of a sound in itself, it, it's a very contemporary trend, I think. That is, you have the two axes, I can't do this with a microphone, but you have uh, um, a vertical axis that has to do with loudness of music, and, and a horizontal axis that has to do with, with the amount of music, that is how the music film is spotted. And it seems to me like on, on, on the one extreme end is the, the you know, yeah, like the superhero film with lots of loud music to compete with the sound effects. And it's carpeted from, from wall to wall. And then the other, on the other side, you have the Nordic <laughs> uh, um, down key uh, drama score. Quite not, not a lot of music and very sparse, very cautious, very soft. Is that an accurate description of, of, the, 
of the scene? I have to say so, yes. Uh, I, and I feel that I was really, really lucky to get to work with Eric on uh, Narvik because he was very open to a lot of music. So I actually wrote 89 minutes of music or so. I've recorded, yeah, so got a lot of space. Um, but yes, my impression, and I've not, this is my only, this and a short film is the only movies that I've worked on in Norway, but I do have an impression that they want it to be, yeah, very sparse with music. It shouldn't take too much space, really. And yeah, to me, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just used to the American way and I I really need music, I feel. Not not because I'm a composer, but I'm just so used to to having something else than just this. It, it, to me, sometimes it could get a little too slow, but it, of course it depends on the story and, and everything. But I have to say with a movie without music or very little music, it's not working mostly for me, at least. Yeah, I, I I agree wholeheartedly, and I I think it it's, it certainly is a trend in, in Nordic film music, and I think there are many reasons for it, and I think part of it is probably how we approach emotionality. Um, I think there is a Nordic distrust for the the unabashedly melodic big scores. It's it it just it seems like a very un-Scandinavian thing to do, unless it's an animated film. Um, but I will say, I mean, I was really impressed with the score last year. I think it was uh, for. It was Pessy Levanto's score for, uh, is it called The Innocents? Yeah, uh, the yeah, Innocents. Yeah. yeah. Uh, great film and a really, really terrific score. Um, and it's sparse, but it's also very pronounced. It's a very, it's it's, it's a noticeable score, um, which I think is, I mean, for me, that's, I really like that. I really, you know, because I, I, there's a place for the music that you won't really um, um notice so much but i but i what i really like is just a beautifully spotted film where what 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 music is there is just the right music at just the right time and it adds something and it's part of the structuring of the film and i think that's something that peso levanto did just beautifully um and i think it was actually a very brave decision because it's you know it's the kind of score that i, I could have you know a, a, a less musical director might have uh, responded uh, adversely to it and 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 because it's it's very um it's a score that you, you it, it's noticeable. It's very clear. Yeah, and, and we speak a lot about sort of bad drones and, and good drones or g generic drones and creative drones. And, and um, one of the, the Norwegian nominee for this year's uh, Harp Award was Grit by Erik Jungren. And it's also very much a TTD uh, score, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing there is how it's being used, because it, it's part of a collage with classical music and pop music, and it has to seek in and out of the psychology of the film in a way. So, so uh, again, I have to point out that we are not sort of bashing drone scores, <laughs> but pointing out that th there is a certain Nordic sentiment in regards to how uh, dialogues or, or in generally how these films should be scored. Well, I think there's a tendency sometimes, not always, but, you know, sometimes I, I, I see Nordic pictures and I think that they're, they're almost like caricatures of, of, of our own Nordic perception of ourselves. Uh, and I think the music can be part of that as well. I mean, I, um, I don't know. I, are we really that quiet? I mean, I, 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 I think, I, I, I think, I think so. I, I, I wanted to say that earlier too, that we are so afraid of showing expression, uh, expressing emotions. Actually, on my way here, I listened to a podca podcast that I just did, where I actually speak about, well, my, my stepfather unfortunately died from brain cancer. And what I talked about in that podcast is that it's so important to allow yourself to feel like here in Norway, we are just, we're like bottled up. We shouldn't feel, we shouldn't express our, express our emotions. Like we should look, look at the uh, Latin people. They're like all over the place and they're romantic and they're just expressive or, or even Americans. Like I remember even before I moved to LA, people told me that, wow, you, you really fit in LA because you're, you're just so open-minded and expressive. And I really did fit in there because you can just have as big a dream as you like. No one's going to judge you. And here in Norway, we have Jantelöven, which just tells you, don't believe that you're someone, <laughs> right? So is that something that you experienced when you now, because you have experience from both of these worlds, when, when you got back to Norway, was it kind of a culture shock, even though you are Norwegian, to to deal with, with the, the filmmakers that, that think of film music perhaps differently than in the US? 
No, not really. Because again, I think that when I, I pitched for Narvik, I pitched so much. I think they just, okay, let's just give her the movie. <laughs> She's writing so much music. Uh, so I wrote lots of music. So they, they didn't know what I was made of, who I was, where I came from. And I remember having meetings with Eric. And if you've seen some of his movies, he doesn't really use that much music. Uh, so I was curious if he wanted to have a lot of music in his film. And well, yeah, of course he said, because this is a big film. It should have a big sound and a big music. So uh, to him, that felt natural. And I remember we talked about the budget and everything. And so it was, yeah, well, uh, probably about 50 minutes of music because that's common in Norway. And then it ended up being around 80 minutes. So yeah, so, uh, 79, I think it was when I counted in the end, but I wrote even more. So it's, um, I don't know, maybe it's something about us as well, because if you, maybe you like pigeonhole yourself in a certain style, that's where you're going to end up. I don't know. I really hope that uh, people will approach me for my style and want me to write like this big music and and again also I can of course write minimalistic like some of the pieces for instance in the end of the, the film is more like Max Richter inspired where it's very uh, sparse and so it really depends on the film as well and the scenes so as a composer you just you serve the film that's what what you're there for um, but it's it's always a good environment for a composer to to be working on a film where the music isn't something, oh my God, I have to have music. More like, oh, I, I love to have music. I wanna have music. And then they just give you lots of cues to work on and then rather that you maybe you write more and then they take it out than just like try to limit it. I think it's for any creative person is really important to feel that you're somehow free creatively and which I really did feel with Eric he is very open-minded and he uh, of course he directed me but he also was he just wanted me to do my thing and then he would tell me what more and more what he wanted and I think that for a composer or any creative it's really important to feel free uh, at a certain level mm -hmm. and then of course you narrow down to what's what the vision of the director is mm -hmm. so yeah, and, and these axes that we're not talking about, these axes of loudness and the amount of music, that was something that you really had to work with on, on Mortal. With, there's a lot of music in that. Well, I wrote about four hours of music. Yeah. Uh, but oh, wow. for But for um, various incarnations of the film, I should yeah. say. Um, but the final incarnation, the final cut of the film, um, well, I mean, it's a story that unfolds uh, starting from a, a plane of reality, and then the final act is, you know, it's it's pure mythology. Um, and um, originally, we just wanted to score it like a fantasy film or or like an action movie. I mean, there 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 were elements of. I mean, I wrote a. There's a version of that score that's fully orchestral from beginning to end. Um, and I don't think that's quite the vision that we really wanted, but it's, it, it was, it was a gradual vision. I mean, it was something that we kind of had to r realize in the process. And so, um, so that film now, um, en ended up being most electronic and then the orchestral elements gradually come in as we're sort of veering towards this other reality. And the last 25 minutes, um, it's just Full on orchestra, um, probably even more than that, um, and it's it's you know it's it's um, it's a very big score um, uh, with lots of elements and lot lots of complex writing and um, certainly lots of romantic writing, but also lots of avant garde writing, and it's 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 a it's a um, it's a lot of ink. Mm -hmm. um, and what was the the what was difficult was how can we morph into that and have it feel Congress with, with the rest of the body of music. Um, so, you, you know, you, you get into, you know, working with motivics and textures and, and you kind of want to hint at something over here, but it's it's very um, nondescript and then gradually it, it, it you know, it, it um, assumes an identity. Um, and um, it was a really fun challenge. And, and, and Andre, uh, like Eric, I mean, he, he's a, he's, he loves music and he's very knowledgeable about film music. So we could have very specific conversations about film music. And I love what you said about uh, you as a composer being directed by a director, because it's, it's actually something we don't really talk about, but that directors also direct us. They're not, you know, we're not just uh, an afterthought. Um, and if you're lucky, you get to work with a director who really knows 
how to push you. And it's not about asking you to do something that's not you, but it's about discovering something together. And um, I felt very fortunate working with Andre with, you know, on that film. It was a really, it was a demanding process, but it's supposed to be demanding. And I think that, that Andre pushed me um, into making discoveries that I probably would not have made if, it, if I were sort of left to my own devices. So, it, uh, you know, it's, it, was, it was a very, um, it was a great learning experience, I think. Yeah, I have to add to that as well, because it's the same for me with Eric also. He pushed me and f I found, discovered new places where I'd never been. And that's the whole point. And that's what I love about film music, that you actually collaborate. So uh, the, the music might end up good, it might end up bad, but it's it's a collaboration. And I think that we need to embrace that because we grow so much and we learn so much from it. And that's that's why I really love filmmaking. It is is a collaboration between all the elements of the film. I, I think that what your these two scores um, uh, are an example of is that we do have, and this is quite important to point out now that we're discussing trends, there is a huge scope of different modes and styles of, uh, in the Nordic countries. You know, you have, you have the traditional big thematic orchestral score in Norway, we have composers like uh, Gautus Doros and Knut Alvensrup Haugen, for example, and you have uh, other things as well. And if you look at the, the Harpa nominees this year, there, there's also, again, a, a scope. Uh, the winner film, uh, uh, Alto, um, uh, the Finnish film, for example, used a far more uh, acoustic landscape. It used these sort of circular um, uh, movements of the trumpet and piano solos to sort of elude the the architecture of, of uh, Alto. Um, uh, so it's far, far more rhetorical than, than for example, uh, Grit by uh, Erik Ljunggren. So you have, you have this scope at the same time you have very special trends, especially coming out of Iceland, I think, yeah. since um, uh, the late uh, Johan Johansson came to fame, it's become almost a sort of international trend in, in his wake. It's drawn, but it's also quite sophisticated in terms of how it's layered and the harmonic language there. Yeah, I, I love that. I think that there's a Nordic sound, really. And, and it might have started, or I think it started even earlier with Sigur Rós and, and Mum. And, Absolutely, and, yeah. And we have, and I think that all, like, we, we even have Max Richter. He's not from Iceland, obviously, but, but you have him and we have Nils Fram and we have... Um, like all these different, I, like there's Olaf this, Uranals, yes, for example. that's yeah, yeah. that's a guy. I've, like they have this specific sound, and I think it's very sparse in a way, and very uh, melancholic and emotional. And to me, it sounds Nordic, and so I really feel that. Well, first of all, there's a really big trend going with all these like series and computer games that are about Vikings and the mythological stuff, and like it seems like there's still this wave going on with them wanting to make even more content from Norway or the Nordic countries because of our beautiful nature and our mythology. So we just, I don't know, we should just worship our sound. I th also, I think it's really important to mention that we have a very good sense of melody. That's why Sweden's doing so great uh, with their pop music like ABBA and, and Norway is also doing well because we have the melody because of folk music. And they don't have the same, like, they don't have that tradi tradition in the U.S. They don't have folk music like we do. And if they do, it's actually inspired by Irish or Norwegian or, like, our kind of folk music. So, what is? Yeah. Not sure what I can add to that. Um, no. Uh, well, I, I, I think that, that there's, there's a certain, there's a certain, Way of of depicting musically, um, there's a way of depicting melancholy that I think I think we've done quite well, and I think the Nordic noir. I mean, it, it's such a big genre, and it's a genre that that's spread to other genres in a way. I mean, it's it's become it's become part of our our common language. Um, I'm not so sure I I subscribe to the regionality of of anything because I think I mean certainly music is something that I mean you, we quite quickly discover that it's even though something might come from a certain um, regional um, folk music. Um, it's always difficult to really say that it belongs to one place because we've always been traveling and music has been traveling with us. So there's, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it, it's more about what connects us than what, what separates us. But but I, 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 I know what you're saying. And I think that there's, going back to the, the let's say, the, the orchestral or the more sort of typical quintessential film musical elements of what we do, um, I think it's important, at least for me, it's been important as a composer to um, write something that even though it might be, I mean, I'm, I'm 
so much of my musical upbringing was was based on on the sounds of Hollywood. I mean, that's I became a composer because I fell in love with the music of John Williams and Jerry Goldsmith, and and that's still with me in a very pronounced way. And 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 it's been part of my journey to find my own um, dialect within that, and and combined with other things, obviously. But I think it's maybe a maybe we should make a point of of what makes us different in one sense. I mean, and I think that you, you, even though it's hard, pro- and we're probably the last people to know, I mean, it would be very hard for me to explain what it is about my music that sounds Nordic or why it sounds Nordic, but I do think it does probably, at least to non-Nordic ears. Um, I think that that's that's a, that's a so that's a such a big and difficult topic. What is the Nordic sound? And it's not really a part of this um, uh, this particular talk. And many people have tried, and many people have failed to yeah. describe it. Yeah. So, so I'm not sure how much we should go into that. But I wanted to before we open up for the questions from the uh, the watcher uh, watchers the what's viewers. Your the viewers. Thank you. The watchers. That's great. That's I creepy. hope they're not yeah. watching yeah. Uh, uh, in that I, way. Please. I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, technology because you said something interesting uh, when you talked about the mortal there was a lot of ink uh, and and it's a sort of a, a dying art form now uh, writing with pen and paper and I'm sort of curious if th- these trends that we have been talking about whether it's the drone or the os- ostinato driven things whether they have been facilitated by the advances in in computer technology or or other forms of technology um and especially like for you for example who I'm not sure how versed you are in 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 these technology n- 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 things not at all uh I I I still write out my my electronic music, you know, pen and paper uh, on a score page, and I I just write what I hear, and I send it to my electronic assistant, Markus Lapparainen. And um, what's interesting to me is when we work together is, and I think again this comes down to music being such a common language, and and we all have at this point so many references in common uh, that when I so for instance I'll write um, you know I'll write a, a something like. Um, a low ethereal ambient drone, you know. Um, you, with, you write this specifically in yes, the... Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll add a verbal description and I'll write the music that I want to hear. And sometimes I might even write something about the texture. Like I'll say, you know, um, I'll I'll ask for a certain type of reverb or I'll ask for it, you know, for it to have a certain graininess to the sound. And I don't even know how you'd go about creating that graininess. I just know what I hear. Uh, and what's what's interesting to me is... Um, he's usually able to to get exactly the sound that I want because it, it, I think we're just so conditioned to hearing these sounds, even the ones that we're sort of inventing. I mean, there was a, there was a, I I wanted to invent a drone that was basically slow the sound of fire slow down. So just like a, you know, the sound of actually just a fireplace or something, and just slow it down and, and detune it, and so there's just like a low rumble, but it's it still has an element of of of, of flaminess to it. Um, and it sounded exactly like what I wanted. Uh, so I, you know, it's it's, it's it, that's kind of what I love about working with electronics. It's, it's an abstract field for me. So I, I feel I can get very painterly in a sense in how I and and. Um, so that's actually the opposite of, of facilitating trends. That what you're describing is more original. Yeah, it, well, it, because I, I don't I don't know technology. I mean, the only technology I know how to use. Uh, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a pen and paper guy. That's that's what I and I don't really. Well, I've been very fortunate. I haven't been asked to retool, and I've been able to uh, sustain a career without retooling. So I'm I'm going to stick to it um, as long as there are trees to cut down. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, no. But but I, I do think that that a lot of the music that that we hear, especially a lot of the film music and a lot of the the techniques and the textures that you're describing, they certainly do come from technology, and and they've also facilitated a whole other type of film composer. Um, I mean, there there were people writing for film now that would not have been writing for film 30 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, so I think you know we're we're hearing new voices, and but music has always been like that. I mean, technology has always shaped us, and um, I'm antiquated. I'm, I I belong to a forlorn generation of composers. I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm probably not the last of my kind, but I'm I'm, I'm part of a dying breed. Uh, and that's fine. Um, <laughs> what did John Williams call himself? And 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 Antediluvial. Yeah, yeah. He's from from before the flood. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but I have to ask you as well, Christina, because you you are you're a bit versed in 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 technology and computer I, and samples and yeah. And, yeah. I love it. I love creating my own sounds, and uh, I've been sampling since I got my first computer. Really, so. Uh, 
back then I sampled my voice because I didn't have a sequencer. So I had to sample my voice into a synthesizer. So I do, it was strange. That's how I got into music production class, even because I was able to figure that out. Um, but uh, I've like, for instance, for Narvik, I, I went out and I, I walked in the snow that was like crass. I don't know, skosh now. I don't know what you call it in English, but it's like very crunchy type of snow. Um, that was supposed to be the soldiers marching. And I've, I, but I also had the string players uh, like do stomping. And for, for instance, for the intro of the film, I, there's some trains coming. Um, you see some trains. And so I, I played, I recorded this drum. And so it sounds like the train. So sometimes I, and hopefully with the blessing of the Sunday Sanders, they didn't say, say anything, but you, you really hear that it is the music eventually, but it's kind of somehow making the music be part of the film. Like I really love making sound turn into music or the opposite. I think that's a fun way of actually just m morphing them together. Uh, maybe it, like it just grows out of something and it gets more organic. And so, I mean, even like back in the day when they, came with the synthesizers, that was an organic uh, because they would even be out of tune if the temperature was wrong. Uh, but now we have, you can uh, modulate your own sound and that will be not so organic. Or you can actually like, for instance, I have Omnisphere 2 where I just sample my own voice or for instance, whistling or the train whistle or, or any kind of sound and I can morph it or I can stretch. For instance, I, I recorded orchestras that I stretched and that became drones. So there's just endless possibilities with technology. And yeah, I just, I embrace it. And I have to say that I love the the resurrection of analog synths. With, you know, the whole synth wave that we're seeing now, it's, it's, oh, it's very close to my heart. <laughs> I just want to point that out, speaking of trends. Um, before we move on, are there any questions? Yeah. No? Eight, eight minutes left. No yeah. questions so far. Just um, write some comments or questions if you have any folks. Uh, we'll be here for a few minutes more. Um, so uh, speaking about all these trends, there are also sort of, how should I say, uh, smaller trends that have sort of come and gone in wave. A lot of you will remember, for example, uh, when American Beauty came on, the, the, the Thomas Newman sound, the marimba based, quirky, slightly skewed uh, Americana sound became the rage for a, for a small period of time and then kind of vanished. There was a period, speaking of singing, uh, around Gladiator, where the where the wordless female vocal became. I hope that comes back. Yes, <laughs> I'm and, here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have all these sort of smaller trends that have, have come and gone. So uh, it's not all these these, these big things, um, but it's it's kind of interesting to hear you now speak about you 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 don't feel like you're part of any. Um, a trend or because you, you have these idiosyncratic ways of working and composing. I just, I just do my own thing. I want to have my own, my own sound. So that's why I just create my own original sounds that no one else has. And I hope that that becomes my signum. Uh, but, but thinking about those trends, I mean, listening on Titanic or, or for instance, John Williams, uh, what's it called with uh, Tom Cruise? You, Minority Report? My, that one. Yeah. Like, they're, like listening to that, I mean, he's a great composer, but some of those sounds, to me at least, sound a little dated, uh, like synthy kind of. And back then, that was, like you're saying, the rage, uh, because it's like a science fiction, and so you needed that kind of sound. But I think that also listening back to some of Jerry Goldsmith's music too, that could in a way sound dated because of the sound, but of course it matches also the picture, so I guess. I actually feel kind of the opposite there. I think that, that I, re I listened to a, a Goldsmith score the other day, it's from 1971 or 73, uh, early 70s. I think it's called The Dawn is Dead. Um, I've never seen the picture, I'm assuming it's a mafia film, uh, but it's some of the freshest music I've heard and it's so hip. And so new, and you know, listening to it like you know, if it if it had been a new score, I would have been completely enthralled, and I would have immediately gone to see who is this composer because this is someone who really knows how to write gritty, and it's so, but it's gritty in a very dangerous way because it's it's not only it's not just was it since uh, no it's it's uh, well it's well was it it's I think it's elect uh, probably like electronic harpsichord, and uh, and there's some string pizzicati and 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 but it's just it, but it has a lot of of early 70s or late 60s sounds to it. 
And, um, and again, coming back to what you said about, about how you know, the renaissance of, of analog sense, um, you know, it, it's something... It's this sort of retro futurism mm. that we're, we're we're seeing, and I think it has to do with with nostalgia, mm. uh, but I also think it has to do with maybe a dead end that we're that we're finding that there are things that we miss and we can't really seem to find it. So we have to reboot almost. Yeah. Uh, I think, sorry, I just think that sometimes it's also about the instrument because yes, a lot of Jerry Goldsmith's music is really cool, and even if it's back from back then. Mm. Um, you should so check this out. This is, uh, yeah, it, I actually it'll, listened it'll, to some of it. Yeah, but the, the dawn is dead. Yeah, yeah and it's, they used that in in Alien, I think, as well, because they temp. I think that that was well. They used Freud at least, uh, but but it's 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 just it, what's interesting. I mean, and you mentioned the, 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 minor, the, Minority Report by Williams. Yeah, as and well. there's some of the drums in there that, for me at least, they rub me the wrong way. So. From the t- well, I, I can see that from technical technolo- technolo- technological <laughs> point of view, um, but I I think that. Uh, what I what I really like about that though, there's a freshness of the writing mm. that I think it just doesn't. It seems to me more modern than most film music I hear. Oh, yeah. uh, 2005 was his last great year. I'm not going into that again. But uh, we have some questions coming in now. Uh, we have one question that says um, you've mentioned instrumental ostinato, ostinati and drones. How do you feel vocal or choral writing fits into that? Uh, Christine, maybe since you have experience from vocal writing, I'm trying to think. I mean, yeah, I've uh, how I've used chorals writing, or even like since we spoke about um, music from the '60s, uh, the 2001 Space Odyssey, you have like long drones of, of vocals by Ligeti or Ligeti. I don't know how you see Li- yeah, Ligeti. Ligeti. So. Yeah. I mean, drones, vocal drones, I mean, you can even think of how the monks used to sing. They also used drones or like these long notes. And I think it's very effectful and really cool uh, how to use it as ostinatos. I, even no, I, I think the thing here is that when, when you have an ostinato based score, how, how is it possible to, I think that's the question, weave organically vocals into that? Uh, or you could read as vocal or choral writing in terms of trends, because that's that's another thing. I mean, there is the, the 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 big epic choir thing. That's I mean, we all know what that sounds like, and it, it, it's usually done quite badly. And and um, another thing that's been kind of a trend in recent years is the kind of the the, the Eric Whitaker esque um, choral clusters, uh, which is another thing that that can be done very beautifully, and it's a beautiful sound. Um, but it's also something that I think will sound dated. Um, 20 years from now, we'll, we will go back and we'll, we'll hear that, ah, that's when everyone was, you know, taken by that fad. And, and of course, I'm, I mean, Eric Whitaker's music is going to sound fresh in 20 years as well, but um, all of the emulators probably will not. Yeah, so, yeah speaking about Synthwave. Uh, second question we've received is, what, have, what has been your experience working with sound designers? Christina? Well, it's really important to have a good collaboration with them because you you're not fighting about space, you're collaborating about space, and so it's important that you you can uh, communicate well with them. And I think I really did that with uh, Narvik. That's maybe the of course the biggest film, so of course also most important. And there's so much shooting and so much um, happening that. And and they had a lot of work to do. I had a lot of work to do. So just to know what what's supposed to be music and what's supposed to be sound design is pretty important to, to establish early on to save both sides a lot of unnecessary work because you shouldn't score a scene if there's supposed to be uh, a lot of bombing and shooting. Or maybe you should, but not so much. Uh, so I think it's super important to collaborate Oh, definitely. And I think the last part, I mean, knowing what, what space is yours and, and especially in, in, in scenes where there will be a lot of sound to compete with. Um, I sometimes do, I don't want to say lament, but almost. Um, there, you know, there are certain scenes where we know what those sounds are going to be like. We, we, we know that it's going to be loud. I mean, and, and but if we'd gone another way, if music instead of sound effects uh, was given a chance to dominate. I think that sometimes we'd get more beautiful results. Um, so, I, I mean, I always love that when you, when you know that they could have easily gone the sound design route. 
um, and we would have loud explosions, and it would have been a very busy soundscape. But I, I mean, like some of my favorite moments in film, especially like in very active, busy action scenes or what whatnot, taking away all those sounds and just having music speak. Oh. I mean, I don't think there's anything more profound than that because it, you, 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 I mean, especially when music, because music often has a, um, a different. There's a different. I mean, just the way we feel tempo. And when we allow that tempo to speak, um, I, ju I, I just, I, I always feel it does, that does something to my soul. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, you don't have to choose what to listen to. I think sometimes that's really nice to just, there's some place actually in this film where it goes into some sort of slow motion feel where they just tune out everything. So you just hear a little bit music and they're like in a fog, like they, mm -hmm. they just took away. So you, you don't, you hear some mumbling and so it's very filtered out. Um. Yeah, uh, and speaking about these the technical things, we have received a technical uh, question. I'll try to read this uh, correctly. It says, many mixing tools already incorporate semi-automatic frequency control or compression, for example. This would allow our tools, programs, to generate music within input parameters. I don't understand anything of that, but maybe you do. Do you see this as an opportunity or as a threat, and why so? Well, do I see this question as an opportunity or a threat? <laughs> <laughs> would be my reply. No, um, I, I don't think I'm equipped to answer that. I've been thinking about it, and I, I honestly, I see that there might be a threat, yes, because... Well, I think there's a lot of music that's made up of already uh, made up drum beats and things that's already m been made for you. So I like, for instance, Fruity Loops, mm -hmm. I think it's almost like you, you can like cut and paste music. So it's not really your composition because it's made up of some already made music. And and yes, computers can really come in, but I'm not sure they're going to have, I really hope that they're not going to, I don't think they, I like, I, I heard about this thing that writes a script based upon like thousands of other scripts. So it has the um, recipe for a good script, but it just didn't work. It wasn't unique. It wasn't, it didn't have the, the emotion and like what makes it human. So I, I really hope it's not a threat, but I, I honestly don't know. And I think that a lot of music that we have is library music. I think, s sorry for those who ever wrote it, it can sound very like automatic. Like it doesn't, has, it doesn't have any soul to me. So I don't know, maybe yeah. for them that's going to be a threat because it's not that hard to make that kind I, of music. I, I don't think it'll ever really compete. I think it's, you know, and we've, we've had this sort of automaton question for through our culture for actually uh, or in our culture for, for a very long time it's not really new um although the technology keeps getting more sophisticated i think it's still sort of a novelty thing i mean it always i mean it's like oh an ai wrote this so, oh great fun um but it doesn't really do much i mean i've and i've heard some really i mean i i guess i've heard what's considered cutting it cutting edge ai composing um and it you know some of the sounds are really good uh but there's just something about the, the uncanny, valley, uncanny Valley aspect of it that you can kind of hear that this wasn't filtered through a human being. Mm. So there's something about the timings and, and the phrasings and it just feels off. It feels unmusical, even if the sounds are musical. Mm. Uh, we're already past our uh, time limit, but we'll try to sneak in the two remaining questions. Um, first one is, uh, it says, tingling piano tones, the piano equivalent to drones maybe. Would you say that it this is one ongoing trend in film music, or is it a cliche already, maybe? Tingling piano tones. I think it's been there for a very long time, and I think it's going to be with us. Mm. Um, it's like this, this drumming guitar sound, which is also very popular these days. Yeah, but, but I, I th there's some, you know, piano has temporarily a kind of a neutrality to it. Mm -hmm. It's such a common sound that I think, you know, if you're, if you're going to choose an instrument that will work with, with most um, sort of ordinary settings, um, it doesn't work really well in outer space for some reason, but it works in, 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 in most ordinary settings. You know, it's, it's just, you'd rather have a piano than, than a, a nobo d'amore. I mean, it's just, a, it's a little bit simpler. Yeah, I personally love the piano, but I cannot stand very synthetic, cheap sounding piano. So I think it's very, very important to have a good sounding piano or, and maybe even your own kind of a sound to it. So you could EQ it and 
make it sound a little different from all the other ones because that's maybe the biggest challenge to have a unique sound of it. Great. We have one uh, question that I wanted to say for last, which which is, <laughs> if you could wish for a new trend, what would it be? Oh gosh, it's a great question. Um, to sum it up in one word, trust. Yeah, it's, it's a good word. Um, yeah, I would say something maybe in, in the same vein that it's just allowing for the music to breathe. Um, and just collaborating back and forth till you find, find, uh, yeah, well, actually, there's one trend that I really wish Norway had that the US has, having really good music editors, because a good edited or like a good tempt movie with music, like put out where uh, that's, it's a dream to work on because then, and also because then if the director approves of the temp without falling in love with the temp, um, you can be more certain that this is actually what the director wants as opposed to like guessing where is it maybe the editor or maybe the sound designers or like maybe it's just random music that doesn't mean anything. So I think that that's a luxury I wish Norway or Scandinavian countries at all would have because it does help. And I'm just going to quickly shoot in that I would like more synthwave, the developing more funky rhythms and me melodies in synth music alongside the traditional melodic orchestral score. That, those are just two of my two <laughs> wishes. <laughs> just stick that in there. Okay, um, I think that's it. Uh, we have passed our time with a few minutes. Uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, watching. I hope it was uh, interesting. And uh, yeah, maybe see you again at another um, Nordic Film Music Day seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.